Welcome to the Growing Rural Podcast, where we focus on all things rural in South Carolina. We will discuss topics on healthcare, economy, education, and the unique culture that is our rural state. This podcast is supported by the South Carolina Center for Rural and Primary Health Care. Please join us for today's topic. This is probably not a joke anybody's ever told, but a historian, a celebrity chef, and a grist mill owner walk into a bar. (laughs) Because this is a little bit of your story, uh, in a way. Um, You know, another way to say is that, so how does a historian, um, you know, become a seed finder? It is a curious story. Um, I'm an English professor who specializes in print culture history. That's what I initially was trained in. But uh, I was also um, an archeologist when I was, um, so material culture was always a matter of interest to me. And um, one of the areas which I studied was um, agricultural literature. I tended to do, history of the book type things where I would read the entire body of surviving works on things. So I read all the ag journals, all the seed catalogs, everything that was connected with the rural world as part of my general studies of trying to understand what people were communicating to other people um, about. And uh, the word about that got out to various people who were interested in um, trying to find the classic ingredients of the South. And um, there was a time uh, in the latter part of the 20th century when Alice Waters, the famous chef from the West Coast, had said that uh, American cuisine is not about sauces like French cuisine. It's about the intrinsic flavor of the grains, fruits, and vegetables, the ingredients that the genius of American plant breeding developed over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And that chef should be focusing on the flavor of those vegetables and grains and fruits. And so um, people in Charleston tried to do that. They, chefs, started using the local grains and produce and um, plugging them into the extraordinary archive of recipes that have survived for this region. We have incredibly rich resources in terms of the formula. But when they did that, the oldest generation of diners in Savannah and Charleston and um, Wilmington said, there's something wrong. The flavor isn't right. And so the chefs are sort of tearing their hair out. Why isn't the flavor right? We're using the uh, locally grown stuff. And it turns out the stuff that was grown locally are the agronomic crops created in the last part of the 20th century. So they were using cocodri, long grain rice, uh, instead of the classic Carolina gold rice, which was the famous rice that, you know, the rice kitchen, the Carolina rice kitchen was based on. And so they went looking around trying to find Carolina gold rice, uh, and it just wasn't available. And they tried looking for the other ingredients like bene, the you know original sort of West African low low seed low oil uh, sesame seed, uh, and the wheats and the other things, and they were not to be found. So a man named Glenn Roberts of Anson Mills mm-hmm. uh, began bringing back the corn because um, there were certain people on the landscape that for various reasons kept old corn varieties. Um, Bootleggers in particular 
fixated on the flavor of uh, of their shine corns. Yeah. And families for multi generations had grown the same, you know, John Hawk corn or something like that. And he discovers this in Dillon, South Carolina. Yeah, he he does this. Uh, he finds some there. He finds some in the in in the um, western parts of North Carolina. Uh, so he brings these corn back, and um, sometime around 2002, I put together uh, a conference in. Charleston called the cuisines of the Low Country and the Caribbean. I'd always been interested in food, uh, and uh, I wanted to connect my agricultural interests with the food interests. And we brought in chefs, um, farmers, uh, and historians, and it's the first time that kind of mix was face-to-face, uh, and uh, Glenn Roberts was there. And uh, Glenn came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I-, I wish we could call this a cuisine here now, but it's degenerated into a cookery. I mean, the flavors that made this food distinctive um, have have vanished, and to a certain extent, there's a kind of charade going on. Uh, I want to bring the things back, but we've lost so much that we we don't know what to bring back. He said, you do research, and, and you do a kind of research that covers everything. You could help us find out what was lost. And so I thought, you know, I had that moment where I'm thinking maybe a month in Thomas Cooper Library down in the microfilm bunker will I can put together a list and hand it to people and I'll get free restaurant meals for the next couple of years or something like that. And there'll be a sort of like black and red fish moment for Charleston or something right. like that. But yeah, this is this has happened before. Yeah. We've had heritage revivals before black and redfish uh, right. you know that's a good example um but, but this ha- is different yeah but what happened was i f- discovered how ignorant i was i didn't know what i was looking at so i spent three years trying to understand what was grown why things were grown together how the african diaspora the native american the european garden vegetables the various vectors sort of converged and and what exactly were grown what varieties of peas why why was this type of cow pea from west africa grown with this type of native corn uh, in cornfields throughout south carolina and there were elements of you know it's i guess it would be an observational level soil science going on. They didn't know that it was nitrogen that was getting leached out of the soil by the corn. They didn't know that the cow peas were nitrogen fixers. And if you grew the two together, you would have a kind of sustainable steady state state system, which wouldn't deplete the nutriment in the soil. It wasn't until the 1840s that, you know, people knew that. But they had seen that if you do these two things together in the same field, and Native Americans, of course, had their beans, corn, squash, three sisters method of growing it. They had made the same observations and a more elaborate set of observations. So um, um, at the end of three years, I walked out of the microfilm bunker at Thomas Cooper Library with a list of about 80 ingredients that had once been essential. And all of these ingredients were not, uh, you know, the flash in the pan on, on the cover of the seed catalog for this year because this was the fanciest tomato known. These were ingredients that had remained as part of the growing system for like over 50 years 
And it's only that kind of durable um, importance that allows an ingredient to become like um, a linchpin of a local cooking cuisine. Uh, the things that were um, essential to the foodways. And um, so we had this list uh, and the next 12 years we went out searching for the lost things. Some of them, all of them were functionally extinct. Some of the things survived in the USDA's germplasm repository. The collection that the United States government maintains of grains and vegetable seeds. Um, but other ones didn't. And uh, so um, there are many stories that could be told about the recovery of those things. But I think the really interesting thing about why these things are important to recover has to do with understanding what the role of flavor is in food. And doing some background for this, I watched uh, I watched your video from the Southern Foodways Alliance about that went to, when you received an, the Keeper of the Flame Award, and I I went into that going I'm going to hear about the history of of food because the the having that background I'm going to hear those historical and in your whole your whole focus really was talking about flavor right and the centrality of flavor it and, is and, and you have to think about it every biological entity identifies what is edible and nutritious in their environment by recognizing certain chemical signatures in what you can nibble on and their nervous systems are hardwired to respond to that. And human beings are no different than a paramecium, a garden slug, or a bird in this regard. The flavor, if this tasted good, um, we know that it is good for us. Before the existence of a nutrition science, for thousands of years, cultures um, had a kind of procedure for determining what was healthful. And it's interesting that, you know, current neurogastronomy, the science of, of trying to understand how flavor or taste functions in uh, the human uh, nervous system, is fixated on taste sensation. That is, the sour, salty, sweet, bitter, umami, and also heat dimensions of things, which are rather instantaneous. But the understanding of taste that operates in traditional cultures isn't so much the what happens in the tongue as what happens in the whole body, wholesomeness is the key term in that world. And wholesomeness deals with um, the satiety that one experiences from eating, uh, the sense of energy charge that one gets uh, from the food that they receive. And this is sort of a longer you know, duration kind of response to ingestion. So, um, one, you know, thinking about the role of flavor uh, in, in food creation, it's really interesting to think that their understanding of how flavor works in the body is somewhat different than, you know, the sort of scientific premises of neurogastronomy operating now. But I have to say, I've been attending neurogastronomy conferences recently because I'm trying to push people to deal with these questions of longer-term ingestion scenarios and how they operate and how actually the stomach serves as uh, feedback loops. Now, people who are interested in diabetes and insulin regulation and, and how 
diabetics lose the sort of governing dimension of it, you know, uh, 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 they have a perpetual craving because sugar has has scrambled uh, their sense of the off switch. You don't need more food. Those people understand, you know, the importance of the uh, nervous system and chemical systems, you know, your enzyme systems response to food over a longer duration. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. The oldest grains that exist on the planet, the oldest vegetable forms are called land races. And in many ways, they embody the entire wisdom of cultures of people about nutrition because they've been seed selected, tweaked to be made more flavorful, more wholesome, more nutritious. And these um, land races, numbers of them survive. And I, I had the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation. One of our tasks is to preserve these things. Why? Because they're repositories of flavor. Uh, and flavor is immediately correlated with nutrition on some sort of unreflected physical way in terms of body response. And, you know, when you analyze the components of things, um, there are varieties of oats that are old, the turf oats, that are almost 23, 24% protein, while the average modern breed oat is around 16 to 17 percent. Those um, high protein oats were, um, were bred for horse feed. Uh, they weren't white oats, they were gray oats or colored oats. And what horse racers wanted was horse rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. Uh, humans didn't eat colored oats in the West because of ergot problems. Um, you can't tell whether your oats have spoiled um, from the discoloration that you'll see in ergot. But in white, you will see, you know, that sort of reddish tinge which says, don't eat this oat because it'll make you crazy. Um, so until, you know, the early 20th century, humans, and when refrigeration allows you to finally eat oats, there was storage problems prior to that that caused the fungus to develop. Now there isn't so much an issue with that. Um, but only horses ate these high-protein oats. Now we could eat them, and we could get the same sort of you wouldn't have to drink Red Bull in the yeah, morning to get you, get you going, or the three three cups of coffee. Uh, your oatmeal could uh, give you the lift for the day. So, but it, it gets into so it gets into these kind of competing views of food because in many ways, okay, food history or food heritage. Sometimes folks look at that as the story of who we were, right? Or is it the or we tend to ascribe food particularly you know, special meals, you know, there's this cultural center around the meal and increasingly maybe not the daily meal. Right. And a lot of what you're talking about is that's the daily meal, not mm. Thanksgiving. That's not, right. Not, you know, a holiday celebration, not a, not even necessarily something we go to a restaurant for. Right. Um, and so, and, and also at the same time, culturally we're pushing to this idea of, you know, hyper prescribing foods and starting to look at them as medicines. Right. When, and trying to break them down maybe by what they, how we identify them, but not maybe what they're made of yeah. um, and, and how we got here, whereas this knowledge has been here. Um, oh, you know, yeah. yeah. And you, I think part of it is we have to reflect on, you know, how did we lose it? Because we're you're you're out in fields and you're, you're scrounging through seed catalogs and you're meeting with families all over throughout the southeast trying to read it. Uh, rediscover if you will or you know find thought to be lost things but we have to understand how we lost them yes well um, we lost them because um, 
in the 19th century, various forces that were connected with developing uh, a food system that could feed a nation uh, forced uh, people to grow um, grains and vegetables at large scale. And whenever you engage in monocropping, whenever you cover an entire landscape with just one uh, cultigen, um, sooner or later the bug or pathogen that loves that thing the most is going to show up and it will find paradise and you'll get these extraordinary disasters. Um, back in the 1890s when uh, all of Georgia and South Carolina were growing these shipping watermelons, um, you know, the Kolb's Gem and uh, um, the Rattlesnake, uh, um, Fusarium Wilt showed up in a small county in southern Georgia and in one season, one third of the watermelon crop gets wiped out. In two seasons, uh, the entire industry is in peril. And a lot of people, you know, in truck farming back in the end of the 19th century, they made their money on watermelons. Watermelons, strawberries, and peaches were, you know, Georgia's big three of, uh, you know, the produce world. And, and so when you have, have farmers that uh, are um, seeing their watermelon crop go down, they're telling the breeders, we need a resistant, you know, watermelon, one that can be grown and, and fusarium wilt doesn't affect. And they found the genetics in, in a West African watermelon. And in the 20th century, you had, you know, Congo and uh, the Charleston Gray watermelons that had resistance. Um, but one of the things that happens is when you have productivity or time to maturation or disease resistance or pest resistance become priorities, flavor gets pushed down. And we had this interesting situation in the early 20th century where wheat breeders um, had all of these tests for wheat, spreadability of cookie dough, <laughs> yeah. um, days to maturation, water load, stuff like that. Flavor was not um, at all <laughs> registered in any of these tests. Yeah, because we're kind of at a weird point where if we go to a restaurant, we increasingly take for granted that people are going to tell us where our food came from. Right. I mean, and you were in some ways very central to that becoming a, a norm. And But we don't have – we're not yet where to we have the same expectation for – what we do every day. Older grains in particular, the land race grains, uh, operate uh, in a different way in terms of how they grow. Um, they have much more elaborate root systems than modern bread, um, commodity corns and stuff like that. And uh, if they're grown in living soil, and that's an important provision because uh, one of the fixations of industrial ag is, you know, there's a kind of fear of pathogens in the soil. Uh, so they try to sterilize the soil, and then they add a kind of chemical supplementation package to the soil. They don't realize that the microbiome in the soil and the mycorrhizal fungus world is actually there to generate um, nutrition for plants and uh, that uh, the micronutrients and, and I'm not talking about you know potassium and carbon and uh, nitrogen the the big the big elements of the nutrition cycle I'm talking about you know the things which make up vitamins and minerals they are taken up more efficiently in these older um, older land races than in a modern commodity corn, which has been designed to take a you know petroleum-based fertilizer and convert it with maximum efficiency into foliage and fruiting bodies. 
doesn't matter about the micronutrients, mm-hmm. but we're going to get four ears of corn off of this stock. You know, that's the way they're thinking. Right. Yeah, the title of our podcast is Growing Rural, so we're playing a little bit of off the centrality of agriculture to rural identity, Um, although we would be the first to say that's not definitional and it's not necessarily the only aspect by far, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, we touched on the concept of foodways, and I think that's not a, it's a, it's a really critical concept, but it's not a concept everybody you know, understands right. and how important that is to not only, I think, the, the past story of rural areas, but maybe the future story of, you know, what. Right. I mean, uh, um, farm families have been the repositories of tremendous traditions, both of growing and of eating. And it's strange, you know, farmers used to save their own seed. Now uh, they often buy seed from other, um, other companies. Um, but when they save seed, um, say, you know, think about that watermelon situation. Yeah. The old watermelons um, had a certain genetic diversity to them. They weren't sort of narrowly engineered to be a precise set of genes. There was a kind of flexibility. So that even in the worst seasons, you would have 20% of the melon crop that survived while in really bad seasons, 100% of a modern cultivar will, won't make. Out of those 20% that do survive, you can take a look at the best ones and save seed from that, and you've got the basis for a strain of this watermelon that is highly water tolerant. And uh, if the climate is trending a certain way if it's rainy season after rainy season you just seed select more and more and you will get more and more of your watermelons making because yeah. they're culturally designed so the, the old farm knowledge about how to do stuff uh, when seed saving you know that's something that's running the risk of being lost when farms increasingly you know purchase most of their seed from some right some other entity and, yeah and there's uh, an, an important story in south carolina about that of uh you know a watermelon so tasty that it needs its own security force oh, um, yeah. and uh and right. so the bradford family in sumter county and you know the the return uh, the return i guess of a a different melon from the yeah. past and and that's really created a you know that's a been a a big business opportunity. Yes, in some ways. And, and we have more than just that. Yeah, and we have the Odell's White Watermelon from the Dutch Fork area, uh, which uh, Roger Wynn mm-hmm. of uh, Rogers Heirloom Seeds uh, maintains. Um, that uh, that's a wonderful melon too, uh, and became the first major crop melon in California in the 1880s. Uh, so big melon. Yeah. So there are lots of really great stories about plants that developed hereabouts that still survive in the hands of farmers here and there, but have lost their foothold as a commercial variety. But when people make taste forward in their calculations, and and the people who really drive the revival of many of these tasty older fruits and vegetables are um, restaurant chefs yeah professionals in the world of flavor and uh, they recognize um, immediately the difference Um, 11 years ago I was in Anson Mills after we had revived I was visiting Anson Mills Uh, Glenn Roberts and I had revived the um Sea Island white flint corn, which was the original sort of grits corn in the mm-hmm. Low Country, the favorite one. And um, he had milled it up, and there was also some standard corn milled up next to it. Tom Caliccio, the chef, walked into Anson Mills. His nose started twitching. What is this I smell? and immediately beelines across the room to this um, 
to this uh, bowl with the white flint corn, and he didn't taste it. He just waved his nose over it and says, I want to order this. That's when we knew that uh, <laughs> that that old favorite corn of the yeah. low country was going to make a comeback. Yeah, and Grits returns to uh, yeah, restaurant tables throughout, Yeah, really throughout the country. Right, and we have to think about Grits. I mean, Insta Grits or Convenient Grits had – had, you know, sort of established themselves as the the family norm. And Lord knows we need convenience because the pressures of our work are, are so great. But um, when you taste, you know, an old classic corn variety made into grits, um, the flavor difference is so great. That's why restaurants embraced it with a vengeance as part of um, uh, part of the revival of uh, regional food. And w- what's interesting is that uh, not only the high-end fine dining southern restaurants, but down to the barbecue stands and uh, sort of food shacks along the coast, seafood shacks, they all, you know, realize that a certain type of cornmeal is better than others. Yeah. Well, and there's been a more recent recognition of, in celebration, really, of um, what we might say of a non-fine dining, barbecue shacks, seafood shack. Right. I mean, that, the, that elevation of that craft, not that they're elevating it, but people are recognizing how what they do is so important. Some of the greatest cooks in the South are home cooks. Yep. And families... Um, some families have their own vegetables, particularly if you go up in the mountain parts of the state. They have beans, beans that have been passed down in families. And I ate the Epting family pole bean recently, and I thought, man, that's that's one of the finest beans I've had in a long time. That's good old South Carolina family that kept this variety of pole bean going and uh, was never a commercial variety. But it has a taste that now has commercial potentials. And there are seed companies, two or three, that sell the seed so you can grow it yourself. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. You know, one of the things that characterizes true cuisines, and we recognize that certain parts of the world have a cuisine. In the South, there's you know, New Orleans, and then there's the Low Country, and to a certain extent, Tidewater have very separate versions of Southern. They have to have certain elements to have that kind of integrity. One, they have to be a reflection of a growing system. That is, there are certain things produced in that locale that make up, you know, the the food. The second thing is that There has to be both a professional cooking uh, component and a vernacular cooking component that are in a constant dialogue with one another, where the best practices of both are constantly being exchanged. And and that's how French cooking became powerful. That's how it became French cooking. Yeah. (laughs) And how various regional Italian forms of cooking become powerful. I work a lot with uh, Matthew Rayford and B.J. Dennis and people who are in in the sort of Gullah Geechee community who are trying to consolidate their food ways in a very fundamental way. Um, And they they are quite interested in, in getting the original vegetables that were once grown um, more widely there. Three weeks ago, I was at a goat barbecue, you know, an old traditional low country kind of things with B.J. Dennis and uh, Marvin Ross, who was the barbecuist and breeder of the goat. Red rice, okra soup, shrimp fritters, uh, goat barbecue, Haitian pickle, uh, which was a hot pickle 
and a peanut mustard hot sauce were sort of the things that were there. And things like okra soup and red rice have sort of become part of the general low country scene. But the pickle, the peanut sauce, the way the shrimp fritters were done, um, the goat barbecue, that's, um, you know, that's old school Gullah Geechee. And uh, that's part of, uh, you know, uh, an inflection. And every part of the South has a similar sort of thing. You think about how the country Cajun Louisiana has engaged in a kind of dialogue with the Creole cuisine of New Orleans with its uh, French and African-American components to it. Uh, It's only when you have these synchronisms, these marriages of various, you know, foodways and practices that you get distinctive kinds of cuisine. The Appalachians have their food ways too. Like in, um, when you get into the mountain country, there are different uh, fruits that you know become important. Uh, um, the apple, yeah. the apple rains. Um, it's very difficult to grow an apple in the low country. We have mulberries, but when's the last time you've tasted a mulberry pie? <laughs> I can't recall I, having had one. Uh, so, yeah, and and again, different intersections between cultures and yeah. those different food ways as well. The Appalachians with a lot more Native American influence. That's right. You know, there's a lot of discussion about the rural urban divide, but when you think about food ways, it seems to show us about the rural urban connections. After the Civil War, when the economy of the South had been ruined. Many southern states picked themselves up off of the ground by growing vegetables for northern markets. This is what was called truck farming. They had grown prior to the Civil War staples, cotton, rice, tobacco. All of a sudden, you had the turn to vegetables as commodity crops. And so one of the interesting things is all of a sudden people are eating many more vegetables and growing many more vegetables in larger scale from 1866 into the 1930s when California starts taking over the vegetable industry. And um, in many ways, I think that that is the greatest moment in, in South Carolina or North Carolina or Georgia cooking when you had the rice still being grown, when you had the corn still being grown, but all of a sudden you had the palmetto asparagus, you had the Charleston Wakefield cabbage, you had the uh, Florida high bush eggplant, you had the Hoffman seedling strawberry, you had all of these vegetables of various sorts being grown they're available, and all of a sudden we had this vegetable renaissance. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of my time in the past 10 years looking at grains, but I think the next period of time I'm going to spend on vegetables. Um, we've got some, you know, we've got the watermelons. But we still don't have the palmetto asparagus, which was once the dominant asparagus consumed in America. And uh, the Charleston Wakefield cabbage is coming back right now. The various varieties of collards that were grown. Uh, There's a a woman named Sarah Ross from the University of Georgia down in Wormslow who's growing out the different varieties of cabbage collards uh, white cabbage collars, yellow cabbage collards, and some of the old, old things like the Georgia blue stem collards, so the oldest collards. And um, comparative tastings of those reveal a tremendous variety. I have many northern friends who 
refuse to eat collards because they think it's like gnawing on an old rubber boot because it's cooked so long it's still kind of chewy. Well, they've never had a yellow cabbage collard, which is so tender that people use it in salads and they make pickles out of it. And there's a kind of, uh, you know, North Carolina kimchi that's made out of it that's really good. Uh, so, so vegetables. And I think about, you know, the vegetables that have been lost, like the, there's a wonderful West African vegetable, the Solanum ethiopicum, the red eggplant that looks like a, sort of like a tomato. Uh, and it was grown throughout the South. It's more bitter. It was fried. It survives in Brazil now. But the last known strain of it here in the South, uh, the seed for it was destroyed 11 years ago in an arson fire in a seed house. It is something that I would like to see once again available. Uh, down in Brazil, fried red eggplant with onions is a bar food. I mean, it's really popular. And uh, instead of uh, eating uh, buffalo wild wings or something <laughs> like that on game day, they watch their soccer matches and eat you know red eggplant and onions fried up. And uh, we had that available here one time. Why can't it come back? Right. You know? Well, it's, it, you know, and we talked about some of the foodways, you know, even in our area, Appalachia, but as well, but, um, you've recently done some work on rediscovering some important, I think, uh, crops and reintroducing them that were Native American foodway crops. Oh, yes. Well. And they're, they're you know, all part of the story. Yes. Uh, there is this extraordinary um movement among Native peoples right now called the rematriation movement, where their traditional foods and foodways are, are being re-embraced and recovered. And over the course of the 20th century, various Eastern bands of Native Americans have lost some of their ingredients. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is that um, some of these things actually still survive, but it's a matter of identifying them and making the connections. A group of geneticists at NC State and I have been working, looking at various old varieties of, of southern land race corn. Um, I'm really interested in dent corns, which were created like in the 1820s to 1840s. They're a kind of milling corn that's made by crossing flint corns and flower corns, or gourd seed corns, which were native land races. Uh, and I was taking a look at some of these uh, with uh, Dr. Jim Holland and Matthew Smith, his grad student up in NC State. And there was one in particular called Lael's Flint, L-A-I-L, that, first of all, wasn't a flint corn, and it looked like an unimproved native land race. Flower corn that has rounded kernels but soft interior rather than flint corns which have rounded and very dense interiors. So we looked at it. I'd been in contact with the Catawbas who'd been looking for this their lost flower corn for about a decade. We had the corn, we had the name, we realized that it was cataloged in the USDA corn collection incorrectly. So what was it? We started doing genealogical research. We hit Ancestry.com hard, genealogy bank. Who were the Lales? It's an unusual name. It's not a standard one. Turns out they're a family that has been in one locale, in Catawba County and contiguous, I think it's Burke County, North Carolina, which in the 18th century was where the Catawba lived. And they moved down to Rock Hill in the 19th century, early 19th century. And this one family was illiterate for five generations. And so they didn't read. 
the latest seed catalogs or bulletins. They weren't uh, enticed by the fancy yellow dent corns like Leeming's Yellow or Reed's Yellow Dent. Southern farmers embraced with a vengeance at the end of the 19th century. They just kept on growing their own corn until a USDA plant collector found it and collected it and put it in the national collection. From Catawba area, unimproved, this is the ancestral Catawba corn. So we contacted uh, George Warren de Lesselin, the cultural officer for the Catawba people, and said, here, here's what we think is your, your corn, and uh, they're growing it out now. Since maize or corn has a sacral dimension to yeah. it, you know, when the Catawba do their corn ceremonies, now they have their corn to do it with. And one of the things I, you know, I think about now is the fact that uh, a lot of the population reserves their family special recipes for holidays. The classic dishes come out, Aunt Jen's sweet potato casserole appears on Thanksgiving, uh, or uh, stack cake appears at a wedding or something like that. Even if it's only available for those special times, it's good to have the right ingredients to make those things that uh, become the sort of focus of the times when your family does come together. Farmers now make up not so large a percentage of the population as they once did, but they remain as absolutely central to the lives of everyone as they have ever been. People who consume food, many of them visualize beyond the produce section in their grocery store, you know, where things come from. So one of the things that I think that we as people here talking today uh, have to do is to show the origin and show that what is grown, why it is grown, where it is grown, are subject not to, you know, the whims of a one economic decision, but are the reflection of really enduring patterns of um, understanding of health, of aesthetics, uh, the preference for certain tastes. And that aesthetics is not anything which is just peripheral. I mean, that's our ability to taste things and identify, discriminate between good taste and bad taste is actually an ancient biological legacy which permits everyone to nurture their own well-being. Thanks for listening to the Growing Rural Podcast. If you found the content valuable, please leave a rating on iTunes or Spotify so others can find us. For more information, please visit our website at sc.edu forward slash rural healthcare or follow us on Twitter at sc underscore crph. This was recorded at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Columbia. It is edited and produced by Sean Riffle. Y'all take care.